What's up, man? All right, so we got Alex Russell from Chuck Town Acres here in Charleston here. And Alex has been gracious enough to, you know, lend his time. I know you're a busy man. Yeah. I appreciate that to tell us a little bit about what you're doing on your farm and, and help maybe inspire some new farmers about what they can do. Uh, we've known each other for a couple years now. Yeah. We moved down and yep. we got your farm going. Things have been going well. So I guess tell everybody a little bit about what, what you do. Okay. So we were on a regenerative farm here in Charleston. We do grass fed beef, forest raised pork, pastured chicken and pastured eggs. We also do uh, Thanksgiving turkeys as well. All pasture based stuff, all regenerative animals, movement, the whole nine yards. We have an online store where we sell all of our products and uh, we are in the home delivery world right now, which is uh, a whole thing in and of itself. Yeah. So, um, but it's got us a lot of customers really fast. Yeah, awesome. so there's a lot to that too. But uh, yeah, we just started uh, three years ago. Sweet. Yep. And what, I guess, touching on the regenerative part, what is that? But I think a lot of people define regenerative agriculture different ways. Yeah. What was what does regenerative agriculture mean to you? Basically, the the most simple way that I can put it is it's raising food in a way that's good for the soil. Okay. And so so what we do builds soil. It benefits the microbiology within the soil. Every year that we do this, we grow better grass on the same pastures without having to add in a bunch of inputs from other places, whether it be um, fertilizers or compost. We don't add any stuff like that. We just run animals in with a movement pattern on the same place and it gets better and better every year. Yeah. I describe most of agriculture in America, especially as conventional or industrial. It's degenerative. It makes things worse the more you do it. Then we also have a small space in our agricultural world that is sustainable, which I basically put as like, you could keep doing these things over and over again. Maybe pasture raised beef that they feed a little bit of grain. Outdoor chickens, but they're not moving. Or you got vegetables in that space. And uh, so, so you can do sustainable agriculture for a long time, but it doesn't necessarily make things better. Where that's what makes regenerative separate, is that regenerative is like a super boost to your soil life, to the lives of the animals, and then the food also has higher nutrient densities and is also better for you as a person to eat. Yeah, no, I like that. Like the sustainable thing is like, you can sustain a lot of things for a period of time, right? Yeah. You can, you can sprint yeah. for a while, Yeah. but but it's it's not gonna last forever, right? Exactly. So you gotta do better than just sustainable. Yes, right, and, yeah. and the amount of damage that we've done to our earth, to the soil, to our own bodies. We need regeneration now. We can't just like get some cool sustainable stuff. Like we're so far down into the world of depletion that we have to really power pack our, our efforts to build back soil and, uh, and we need it across the whole country. Yeah, I think that's awesome. What um what kind of regenerative techniques and, and strategies are are you doing on the on the farm? So each enterprise has its own special place in the regenerative world. With grass fed beef, we move our cows every single day. So we're taking these cattle, we're we're bunching them up into tight groups and they're gonna be grazing a small area, enough for them to eat for one day and then we move them on to the next space. And what that does is it, it lets all the grass grow up. It sucks out a bunch of carbon out of the atmosphere to grow awesome grass. Cows eat it down and it resets the carbon cycle. So instead of having cows on one big pasture their entire life, where your grass always stays this tall, we're letting our grass go through cycles of rest and recovery and, you know, grass grassland has a certain period where it grows super fast usually four four six inches to like 12 to 24 inches it grows crazy fast in that cycle so you're gonna be able to suck way more carbon if you can get your grass that tall but if you continually graze your cows are going to keep your grass about this tall all the time and 
you're never going to be able to get into that rapid carbon sucking space for your grass. So that's why we pack the cows in tight. They graze it down real tight. And then they, their manure is more concentrated as well. Then we move them onto a new space. And that area now has time to receive the nutrients in the manure. And it also has time to get rest and grow back. So that's, that's with the cattle, with the chickens and the turkeys and all the poultry. We have um, these big mobile chicken coops that we do the same thing. The chickens eat lots of grass, they eat the bugs, they put their manure down and then we move them off and that land gets to be fertilized by the manure. And then in the, with the pigs, we move our pigs around in paddocks the same way that we do the chickens and the cows, but the pigs are gonna be eating brush, thorn bushes, blackberries. I mean, they're gonna be, they're basically bulldozers that clear nasty brushy spaces. Then we move them off that space and beautiful green grass comes up where, where that was. So yeah. we're, we're taking, with the pigs, we're taking like crazy overgrown areas and turning them into like a savanna, silva pasture kind of space instead. Yeah. So if, if what we're doing isn't making the space better, we don't want to be doing it. We want to, we want to be able to be in constantly improving what we're doing with the way we raise our animals. That's great. Yeah. yeah and I think you hit the nail on the head, basically it all comes down to movement, right? You got yeah. a bunch of animals in a small space and, and they make a big impact and then you move them. Yep. Allow that land to rest, allow that grass to recover, allow that environment to, to absorb those nutrients and grow back even faster and stronger and healthier than it was before, yeah. before you bring them back in. Again. Yep. That's, that's yeah. the model and it works for every animal type. Yep. I mean, you could have guineas and rabbits or, you know, you could have cows and pigs and chickens and it works. Animals in nature move around. They yeah. don't, they don't sit in one space. And for some reason, American agriculture has turned into an ideal where we just keep animals in one space their entire life. And it's completely unnatural and yeah. it's degenerative and it's a lot of times on concrete, too, on concrete. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. 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 It's yeah. Not where they belong. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. And then you, you end up with products that aren't good for people to eat and people are more sick than ever before. And I think it's directly related to the way we grow our food. Sure. Um, so and when you got a thousand animals in a confined space with no fresh air indoors, uh, right? I mean, yep. that's going to breed disease and, and viruses yep. and everything else, right? So it's not good for the animals. Yeah. So there's so many great aspects of regenerative agriculture. We're healing the land. Um, the animals are healthier. You know, they're in a better environment. And the other thing is we're also producing more nutrient dense food, food that's healthier for people. Yep. Yep. Right. You right. Know, we see all the time. We got things like avian high path, highly pathogenic avian bird flu um, that's going through and wiping out flocks. You see the price of eggs going through yes. the roof. Right. And I don't see any. I don't know any pasture based farmers. There might be a few out there that have had any problems with avian flu. Yeah, I haven't heard of a single case so far. And uh, when your birds are healthy already, and a disease comes through they should have the immune system to be able to fight off that disease. Right. But if you've got birds that are sick all the time and need medication just to live like factory chickens or any, basically any eggs that you get at the grocery store, those are from animals that are sick all the time. They're in an unnatural environment and they're basically just alive because they have an IV of yeah. medication going their yes. arm. They're in hospital. Yeah, they're crazy. being they're being propped up and yeah. kept alive so they can they can at least like a Marriott. Yeah, right, almost, right, 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 right. Yeah. It's already halfway <laughs> it's dead, like just, but it's eating. just pulling the strings to keep it alive. Yeah, right? just keep eating the feed, <laughs> keep drinking the water. Well, they wait till you're six weeks and then we can butcher you. Um, or we'll keep you alive and keep laying more eggs in that cage. It's interesting because the government subsidized foods are getting more and more expensive in the grocery store. I was in the egg aisle just the other day, just kind of checking things out. And I hear it's all crazy with eggs right now. So I went in there and checked it out. The white crap, the cheapest eggs possible were like $4 and 30 cents for a dozen, which they used to be like a dollar or maybe $2. Yeah. So they've already like doubled, tripled in price. Then I looked over and the pasture raised eggs, which we all know 
pasture raised eggs in the grocery store, they don't have to be pasture raised. It just means that you can have a door on the side of your factory. Yeah, it's a BS label. That they can go outside. No one says how big the door needs to be. No one says how big the outside part needs to be. So you could have a six inch door with a one, in, one foot opening outside and call it pasture raised. Anyway, we know those eggs are at least better than the white cheap, cheap eggs in the styrofoam thing. Those eggs were $5. Yeah. And so we're, we're in a time right now where even the cheap subsidized foods are going up and up in price because those systems that we've built for cheap food, which were made to basically get people enough calories so we can stop starving, which we've accomplished that, but now we're seeing those cheap foods are not built in resilient systems. And so they, you know, a bird flu comes in and all of a sudden it's gonna knock out millions of chickens because those chickens are already sick. They're knocking on death's door already. And so we, by supply and demand, those prices have to go up. And I think that's a trend that we're seeing is that commodity foods are just going to get more and more expensive as fertilizer prices go up, as land prices go up. And so hopefully we're going to start to see regenerative foods. Um, we already know we're far superior as far as flavor, texture, um, nutrition, nutrition. Yeah. but we might even be able to start competing on a price standard as well if these commodity food systems continue to crumble and by supply and demand i mean the feedlots in kansas this summer when it was 120 degrees in kansas we lost tens of thousands of of beef cattle in a single day because they were all in feedlots and if those if those cattle were on pasture the the soil would have been cool enough because of the grass and the covering of the soil those beef cattle would have been fine and they would have lived yeah. but we're starting to see the crumbling of a a corrupt destructive degenerative food system and wouldn't it be amazing if one day our government woke up and said that they wanted to subsidize small farmers because they're the ones that are actually doing things that are beneficial for the land beneficial for people's health beneficial for the planet it's a utopian it's a utopian dream it's, it's maybe one day yeah but maybe fantasy land yeah yeah <laughs> fantasy world yeah but, that's yeah. where all it's of great. us we can keep we can keep hope that's where all of us farmers go in our dreams in a land with government <laughs> subsidies and people treating us well and we're not under threat by the giant food corporations around the world uh but i would say one thing with the subsidies is, is particularly you hear about a lot of farmers uh, that raise conventional uh, products, commodity products, depend on the subsidies. They literally yeah. grow corn knowing that they're going to lose that crop. They don't care. Just waiting on that check to come, that insurance check yes. to come in. Right. Um, right. And that's their whole game plan. It's like, I'm just going to wait for the check to come in if I lose this whole crop. Yep. And that's a terrible way to set up, set up a business. Absolutely. Um, it's a huge waste of land. It's a huge waste of land, yep. space. Small farmers, we don't, we don't have that subsidy. We don't no. have that crop insurance typically like that no and it's a much better business model you know we can't compete with these huge companies anything about costs like one you know, we're seeing the cost narrow between conventional food and regenerative food it's getting the the price of food in the store is getting closer and closer together which is yeah. good for a farmer yeah but one thing to think about is i'm raising a few thousand birds on my farm right <laughs> yep tyson's raising 30 Millions. million a year right yep i'm paying 30 cents a pound for feed do you think Tyson, who's buying 100 million pounds of feed, is paying 30 cents a pound. No. There ain't no way. No. They're, they're, and, they, and they grow the feed. They own the farmers. They own the land, the yep. tractors. They're growing their own. Yep. They, they might be a penny of feed or, or a fraction of a penny of feed. I don't know. Yeah. But when you're selling a whole rotisserie chicken that's seasoned and cooked for $5 in yeah. the grocery store, yes. my feed cost is more than $5. Yeah, right? right. And that does include my chick, my processing, my labor. My processing cost goes is more than $5. That. So... Yep. We can't compete on that level when it comes to price. I mean, it's just so artificially low because they have such a scale. They have government subsidies. Yep. But where these small farmers come ahead is nutrition and flavor. Yes, and, exactly. And supporting the local economy. 
yep. and doing good for the environment. And, yes. And we subsidize these big corporations to have cheap food, but yep. that cheapness at the grocery store, that yeah, cost comes with a price. Comes with a price, and the price yeah. is your health. Right? Yep. What's the cost of cancer? Yeah, if, exactly. If you get cancer from all these terrible you know, additives and chemicals they put in the food. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Right, right, um, yeah. And we'll, we're starting to see that customers and your regular mom, your soccer moms and your, and your dads that are food conscious, they're starting to demand healthy food. Mm -hmm. I mean, you think about going into Walmart to do your groceries 10 years ago, they didn't have like an organic fruits and veggies aisle, yeah. right? But now they have an entire wall of organic produce mm -hmm. in the thing because that's what people want. And so we're starting to see people vote with their dollar. They're willing to pay $4 a head for organic lettuce from the local veggie farmer mm -hmm. instead of paying a dollar for a head of conventional lettuce. It's exciting so, time to be a farmer. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's this, time and probably like the early 1800s is the best time to be a farmer <laughs> like right now uh, we've had our, our average customers more educated more knowledgeable about regenerative agriculture and food and nutrition yes. yeah. than they've ever been yeah there's more awareness out there there's the the economy has increased more than it was you know in the 40s people have more yeah. disposable income so they can afford better food exactly um, and then you're getting the vulnerability of the industrial food system with like avian bird flu with um you know cattle dying yeah, uh, you've got droughts. COVID and shutting down. COVID shutting food down. Processing the, yeah, facilities. You've got um, droughts in California where people were burning hundreds of acres of almond and pecan trees. You know because yes. they couldn't, didn't have water. Yes. Um, you know it, it's just you know and you got weather patterns shifting and, and making growing harder and harder for certain places. So the price of food is just going to keep going up. Yeah. It's going to be harder to grow and 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 it's never been a better time to be a farmer to support your your local economy and your yep. local customers, right? Yep. Exactly. Um, so I, I just see it as a, as a good thing. It's going to be better and it's going to improve yep. over time. Yep. And hopefully we can inspire more people to to get some chickens in your backyard or to go find your farmer or to go buy three acres somewhere and start raising your own garden yeah. and, and start cooking plant in your kitchen. Plant a tomato plant in the backyard. If you got a porch, just plant yeah. a tomato plant. You know, yeah. Start somewhere, right? Yep. Yeah. Exactly. And you can see how much better those fresh fresh off the vine tomatoes taste. Yes. And that always tastes better when you cook, when you grow them yourself too. Right? Yeah, they, they do. Yeah, do. yeah, yeah, a little sweat. <laughs> a little sweat. Yeah. In there, right? uh -huh. Yeah, exactly. I'd like to ask you a little bit about your marketing and sales on your farm, oh, that's right. Yeah. So what are your current kind of marketing and distribution channels? Pretty much we have an online store and we sell direct to consumer through our online store. We don't ship any products yet. Maybe we will in the future, but we have found enough people locally that want what we have. And so we do door to door home delivery. People go online, they'll place an order. And every week we bring the orders into town and we do delivery, we stop everywhere. And that's 95% of our, our sales. Well, we also have the farmer's market in the summertime. So we have a farmer's market that's six months out of the year and so we do a lot of sales there too. It's how we've met most of our customers because the kind of customers that you want are gonna be at the farmer's market. At least, hopefully, scoping things So how out. are you collecting those customers at the farmer's market? Basically, I have um, some decent signage that, that tells people right away who we are, what we do, and what we have. Okay. And um, I also, one of my biggest strategies for at the farmer's market has been to put the eggs out on the table open. Yeah. And on display, um, we have like the rainbow colored eggs. And so that's been like our biggest strategy is to, is to attract people with pretty eggs on display. And then we have some signs that say pasture raised chicken, grass fed, grass finished beef, forest raised pork. And people see that kind of stuff and they're immediately attracted to it and they, they want it. 
are you collecting emails at the market or yes. are you okay yeah yeah so that gets brings them into your world exactly on your email list and then you can yeah. send an email say oh by the way here's our online <clears throat> store yep you can pick it up or we'll deliver it to you yes we're not crazy aggressive with collecting emails but we have a sheet that we have out there it just says name and email and you'd be surprised at the amount of people that want to sign up yeah it's kind of wild offering as an incentive for them to give you your their email nothing address. Nothing. Nothing. Okay. I just, it says something like, give us your name and email and we'll keep you in the loop. Yeah. Or something cool. like that. And, and. They buy the eggs or they buy the beef, they love it. And they're like, yeah, I'm signing up. Yeah. They want to know more. Yeah. Yeah. That's so cool. I, I, um, I'll plug their emails into our newsletter system. So they don't just get one email saying, Hey, welcome to the farm. Here's, here's a link to our website. They'll get a series of emails. We've set up with MailChimp, we have like a, a an onboarding thing, here's what we're about, thanks for signing up, that kind of stuff. But then also they get automatically thrust into the newsletter world that I write um, about every other week. And I'll, I'll just put in my newsletter, you know, stuff that's going on on the farm, some of my like, you know, crazy rogue food thoughts and theories and stuff like that which we all have and and um and then i might do a sale or something on the newsletter if if we've got a bunch of product that needs to move okay. um but yeah the amount of people that have signed up for that with no incentive at all is has been crazy i bet you if i did an incentive free pack of chicken wings or something like that we may even have a ton more emails um, yeah. but we started three years ago and we've got, we just crossed over 2000 email addresses awesome. all just through that sheet and through our online store. So as soon as someone buys one of our products, that email gets collected and put into the newsletter world as well. We do a tiny bit of wholesale. Um, we have like a local hippie grocery store that we sell to, um, and they sell our products on the shelves, <clears throat> but we don't do any restaurants. We've done restaurants on and off before, but currently not doing any. Um, like we talked about with margins and, and food costs, we've, we've tried to make it our goal to stick to retail and direct to consumer, yeah. cutting out any middleman where I'm gonna have to lose a big chunk of my margin. Um, I, I think as we grow and we get bigger, we'll probably need to start making relationships with restaurants to be able to offload stuff like chicken wings and ham hocks and stuff that typical moms, dads don't like to cook at home. Yeah. We'll never have to sell chicken breasts or ground beef through a restaurant. Um, that's what people want, sausage, a lot of sausage. But uh, that's pretty much our, our main thing. Farmer's market, online store with home delivery, and then a tiny bit of wholesale to a local grocery store. Did it take you some time to build that customer base on the for your online store? Would you or would you recommend yeah. like a new farmer just starting out, would you recommend them doing the online store right off the bat or wait for that or Yeah. That's a really good question. I would I would say to the new farmer, go try to get while you have time, go get in a few farmers markets and go meet your people. Be charismatic, be friendly, be enthusiastic tell people about your farm and what you're gonna do and get your face in the minds of your customers. And then you can start building your online platform. You're, there's different software groups like the one we work with, um, it's called Barn to Door. They pretty much do a lot of the work for you. Mm -hmm. You just pay them to do the work. So if you can afford it, they'll build your website for you. They'll build your online store and a lot of that. So it's like, that's the nice. stuff. It takes all that technical stuff off. That's the stuff the farmers suck at. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> it's really nice if you can hand that off to somebody. Yeah. Um, and that can start to be built and you at least you have it there. So when you get your really like raging, hardcore customers that are really pumped about you, they're gonna start trickling over there mm -hmm. and, and they're gonna sign up for your subscriptions on there and they're gonna, buy your t-shirts on there and they're gonna buy the hats and whatever, you know, like they're gonna be able to send, you wanna be able to have a link that can send, that they can text their buddies or put on their own Facebook or Instagram. They can share. Yeah. Something easy that's another thing other than you being in person because you're only in person 
like 2% out of the week. Right. So how can you get in front of new customers or recurring customers when they're at home and they're hanging out at night at 9 p.m. and they think about hamburgers and sausages? Yeah. That you want them to be able to go online real quick and put an order in, and then they can pick up at the farmer's market too. And mm -hmm. so then you can start to kind of like regulate more and more sales by having that option available for people. Yeah, I, I like that idea. <clears throat> I think it's a great strategy because then you're in one place, they can pick it up, you're picking up new customers. Yeah. Um, so yep. really the key would be start at farmer's markets, get your name out there, start building customers. Yeah. Maybe start with the email list early so you can start collecting those emails. Yes. And then look at branching out and doing the online store. Yeah. Maybe using a middleman like Barn to Door, Grace Cart, one of those types of things. Yep, exactly. Um, and go from there. Yep, yep. The, and you want people to know who you are. You want people to, to be able to connect the farmer with the food. I think there's a lot of online companies that are trying to do food and like trying to do like pasture based yeah. foods with a home delivery thing. And I think that works. But I think what's going to be more sustainable going forward as an entire movement is people actually knowing who grew the food. You right. know, if you get a butcher box thing, it just says butcher box on it. You know it doesn't. It, it doesn't yeah. say you know like what farm it came from. You don't know how it was raised. You don't know anything. About yeah. It. They yeah. could have just. They could have bought those T bones from Costco and throw yeah. them in there and said butcher box. Yeah. And you know, repacked them. Yeah. That'd be illegal. But yeah. they might. They could have. still do it. Yeah. So the transparency in the food system is I think what's what's it's really huge, yeah. thrusting this whole movement because people are tired of smoke and mirrors and and they want to know how the food's grown, they what it's like. Farmer. Yeah. And I think the other thing with food is people want to support local. They want to know their farm. They want to be able to visit the farm if possible or at least see all your pictures and stuff on social media. Yeah. Because right. there's a connection, right, with food. Like yeah. there's a lot of people who work in an urban area who may not even step on dirt. You know, they, right. they go from their apartment to the sidewalk, to their car, to their office, back to the car, you know, yeah. on concrete. You know, yes. never even see dirt. Yeah. And it's like the only way they really get connected with food and yeah. and, and the environment is just by that little relationship, that the short interaction at the farmer's market yeah. or buying their stuff online. And so it, they really have that intrinsic just relationship with their food and the, and the land and the environment. That, and that's yes. kind of their only connection, right? Yeah. And I think it means a lot to those kinds of people. If they're buying like a, a an iPhone or a TV or a T-shirt, they could care less where who yeah. made it. Oh, let me see who the who's the who's engineer the, who, yeah. who put this screw right. on my iPhone. No. They don't care. You know, there's no connect intrinsic connection there. But when it comes to food, I think it really yeah. grounds them and develops that relationship and knowing yeah. their farmer, knowing how their food is raised. So, and they like um, being able to live vicariously through yeah. you through your social media too. If yeah. you can. And you, if you can kind of give them a, a farm life experience mm -hmm. through your online um, social media stuff. Stories, right? People love good stories. Yeah. And pictures from the farm. They always comment on that stuff. I'm always yeah. surprised that they love it so much yeah. Um, yeah, because I didn't think of that as a, a way of entertaining people. But gosh, they love hearing about the cow that got out or the yeah. or the chicken that you saved from the neighbor's dog. Or... I've noticed the same thing. Yeah, I'll post something and, uh, on social media or email, like, you know, the fox killed my chicken. Normally, that's not something I really want to show, like a dead, yeah. mutilated chicken, but they're yeah. like, they can relate to it. Like, oh my gosh, it's so sorry that happened. Yeah. You know? And they start asking about it. And like, yes. they really, yeah, live vicariously, like you said, through your farm, through what you're doing. Yes. So, which is cool. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. It's been a whole world that I haven't, that I wasn't ready for. Um, was the social media world with, with the farming side. Um, before I started this business, we I didn't have any social media. I was anti-social media. I, I did not like it, I didn't want it, um, but I knew it's kind of business suicide not to have it. Mm -hmm. So we got one and um, I didn't want to put myself, my face on there for a long time. I wanted to be private. Eventually I gave that up too. And that's when I really started noticing that we were getting more attention online mm -hmm. is when I started, I guess it's all algorithms, but Instagram knows that people want to connect with other people. And so right. you could put a picture of some meat on there, or you could put a picture of yourself holding meat on there. And Instagram is going to send that picture with you and me to way more people. 
then and so you're going to get a lot and more people exposure. Relate to that a lot more. people like yeah. that far better that they can relate yep. to oh here's the farmer yep versus here's a package of ground beef yes not very yeah not very attractive right? exactly uh, looking at a package depending of on how you feel about ground beef yeah yeah <laughs> of course if i look at my face like he's not very attractive yeah. <laughs> it's good to cure the face out there too you yeah. know but uh but no nah, it's good dude. to see the face and make that relationship yeah right? human point, so. human contact yeah. uh, human connection human um, connection yeah they're looking for that and it, it's all it goes back to the transparency mm -hmm. they want to know that a person grew the food that person packaged it and and put put it in a bag and brought it to your house yeah. and and that is like the ultimate food system mm -hmm. for people who want the healthiest food possible that's what they're looking for is is that consistency the transparency we see a lot of of awesome reactions from farm tours that we do we'll show we'll do a hayride we'll take people around and we'll show them these are like the chickens and these chickens are going to die in two weeks <laughs> we're going to kill them and right. clean them and put them in a bag and you're going to eat them and normally you think that's crass or it's too aggressive or you know i don't want to think about it but the amount of people that will buy chicken at the end of our farm tour is like crazy yeah. you know they'll, they'll see a cow they find like connect with it and wrap their head around the whole thing like, yes oh chicken isn't born wrapped in plastic yes yeah. exactly yeah and, and i do i do uh, hopefully a decent job of describing to them what we've got going on here and what the grocery store chicken what that chicken's life is like with all the medications with the concrete with the you know with the factory with the a million other and chickens and everything else yeah living in their own filth of manure no fresh air yes yeah, yeah like that's your choice or you can buy this one that's that's raised well that has a good life that gets to be moved on a fresh pasture every day like even deep within us as human beings we know that animals have to die for us to eat whether you grow vegetables and you're you're killing crickets and ants or whether you're gonna go ahead and just eat a chicken directly. We know that, that animal has to live, that animal has to die and it's gonna nourish us. So I was really afraid and hesitant to show the animals originally because yeah. I was worried about people saying the, I don't wanna know about it thing, but I've gotten over that and I, and I, and I don't mind being completely transparent with the entire process. This animal is born, we raise it, we kill it, we package it, and we bring it to you. Yeah. And and I hope that if we get enough farmers and people willing to say that and express the entire process, then as humans we can return to the, the basic knowledge. You know, yeah. where grandma would go out and get the hatchet out and chop the chicken's neck off. Grandma didn't she wasn't saying, oh, I don't want to think about how the chicken got there. Right. And, and, and it was food. Survival. It was food. Yeah. And hopefully we can get back to that mindset as people where we accept that if we want to live, there has to be death somewhere. Whether you're going to be killing soil microbes with, with pesticides and fertilizers, or you're going to kill a chicken, or you're going to kill birds and squirrels with a combine, <laughs> something has to die for us sure. to eat. And we... We, that's how it's been since we have been humans mm -hmm. for the entire case. And, and the only thing that switched our minds was TV dinners, big super grocery stores, and and super convenient cheap food. Has, and that chemical laden food is killing a lot more animals than that chicken. Absolutely. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So let me yeah. um, let me ask you. So as far as your your sales and marketing, you said you, you're doing a lot of the farmers market in the summer. You're doing the online store. Are you guys kind of hitting the goals and projections you're setting for yourself? Yeah, the first two years we did not, and it was depressing and really tough. But I think you have to go through a, a kind of trial by fire period when you're yeah. starting your farm business of people don't know you exist. It's not that they see you and eh, don't really want it. It's just that it takes a while. It's time. And it takes consistency for people to find out who you are, what you're about. Um, they want to know that you're not just a flash in the pan and that you're going to be here at the farmer's market this year, but not next year. They want to see consistency. So 
the first two years were really rough for us, um, especially during the winter and the off season from the farmer's market. We had almost no sales at all. And we were having to scrape pennies together and, and figure out how to make sure everybody got paid and and that the animals got fed and like, and, and so that was really tough to get through. This year, we finally are uh, going beyond our expectations uh, financially and through sales, mostly thankfully due to subscriptions. Our, our whole subscription thing has just taken off like crazy. So it's, tell me about that, how you use yeah. subscriptions. Um, so uh, we use Barnador, they organize it. I just create the subscription boxes Mm -hmm. And um, my customers pick which ones they want. We went through a lot of, of R&D trying to figure out what do people actually want. Normally, you go to the grocery store. This is the mindset of your customer. They go to the grocery store once a week, maybe twice a week. They pick out the things that they want to eat that week. They bring it home. They cook it. So a subscription model is not really like what we're used to with food. We're used to it with Netflix, with uh, insurance. We're, we're used to it with you know, auto pay for your car, like, but it hasn't really gotten into the food system until now. And so what I found out is that people really like a, a small box, not a giant thing full of meat, um, if you want consistent customers. Now you've got your rogue people that want a quarter cow or a half a hog or something like that. And there's space for them as well. But the consistent buyers that have kept us alive through this winter have been the people that want three pounds of meat and two dozen eggs once a week or once every other week. Um, and they don't want crazy stuff. They want chicken breasts, ground beef and sausage. The stuff they're used to, easy yeah. to cook. Yes. yes. Yeah. And with that subscription, um, you're just, they, they sign up for their subscription, you're automatically charging their card each week or every other yes. week unless they cancel. Yep. And then is there, they come to the farm to get it? Is there a pickup location? You're doing home delivery? Uh, all the above. All the above. All the above. Okay. Um, the, the software that we use is, is pretty user friendly. So they, if they're out of town, they can go on there and sign in and skip this week or skip that fulfillment if the freezer's getting too full. Um, but the nice thing is it automatically charges their card. Their card's loaded into the system after the first time they make a purchase. And so um, they, they don't have to think about it anymore. I don't have to think about charging them. It just happens all automatically. And it makes the thing so frictionless that people are really, really starting to love it. And awesome. we gotta find a balance between how many eggs do you give them for how much meat you give them and some people I do have customers that like don't eat pork or don't eat eggs or don't eat beef and so I think it's a good practice to be able to be a little bit flexible and create custom stuff for those people as well there's not a ton of them but it is nice to be able to offer them something sure. um, well, our most popular box is two dozen eggs three pounds of meat and you get it every other week um, which I thought was not, I thought the weekly one was gonna be more popular because that's how much food I eat in a week. Right. But um, most people, it seems like most people want to run out and then be looking forward to your next delivery. Yeah. Where the weekly box, you almost hit it on the nail on the head every time or they still have some leftover product. They got four or five. They got to work through like, it. Um, it's too soon. It's yep. too soon. Then they want to cancel or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's, they, pop, they, get they bought it and it's getting delivered. So they're yeah. going to get it whether they eat it or not. Right. Yeah. yeah so we've seen, sense. we've had a lot of people switch from weekly yeah. to every other week. Um, but I didn't want to be delivering tiny little boxes of food every week to a bunch of different houses. Right. If you do every other week or once a month, Way easier yes. on you. Way easier. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So bigger so, orders, bigger yeah. boxes. Yes, exactly. Makes it worth your time. Yeah. So I found that like a $75 box was a really good, that was worth it to me. If I could get 10 to 20 of these people signed up that are doing $75 boxes, that's worth it to me to load up all this stuff, put it in my truck and drive into town. We're really hoping that soon we can get into a delivery hire a delivery driver with like a van and stuff. Yeah. That would be really great. Um, but for now, I would encourage 
um, new farmers and people starting their farm business, be willing to pack the stuff in your truck and drive it in for a little while to yeah, save you to. save yourself some money. If you have like a rainy day or something, you wouldn't be doing anything on the farm anyway. And you can also, another option would be, we've done this before, is a customer can come pick up on the farm for free on Saturdays yeah. or whatever. Oh yeah. Or you can have it delivered to your house. But if you want me to drive it to your Charge. house, you're gonna pay 10 bucks, yep. right? To cover yep. my gas and my time. Yep. And then That's what we if do. you hire a delivery driver, well then that $10 goes to them. Yep. Right, you don't have to do delivery. You don't have to take that time, and you're still getting the same sales, say the same sales, right? Yes, so, and exactly. it's convenient for the customer if they're willing to pay that. So yeah, I think we have a cutoff of like a hundred dollars. If you spend more than a hundred dollars, you get it free. Okay, but if you if you're under a hundred dollars, which most of our orders are under a hundred, then it's it's like a seven dollar delivery charge. Okay, and and at least covers your gas as long as you're getting you know. 10 deliveries or more. Yeah. Start small, right? Don't try to do the whole. Yeah. That's what we did. We started doing deliveries. And I was like, yeah, we service this whole area in our radius. Oh. And it was like one delivery here, one yep. delivery on the other side of town, 60 miles away. Yes. And you're like, oh my God. This is so yes. like, right? Start small. Start small location. if you can. Yeah. If yeah. you can. I understand yeah. a lot of farmers are out in the middle of nowhere and it's an hour to the next, or two hours to the next big city. If you can pick a small, heavily populated area, and just, well, you could do Facebook marketing, or you can try to get in that farmer's market and try to blast those people, mm -hmm. instead of like trying to cover 60 to 100 miles yeah. in a day. Yeah, yeah. It'll drive you nuts, because yeah, you'll have- yourself in the ground that way. Yeah. You'll have one order <laughs> that you gotta drive 40 miles. That will make you wanna quit right yeah. there. You wanna avoid the stuff that's gonna make you wanna quit. So speaking of that, What's the biggest regret, or maybe not regret, but I always try to think I don't yeah. have any regrets because I learned something, but yeah, yeah, what's yeah. the one thing, if you could go back and do it differently, you would do starting your farm, whatever it is, some something on your farm that you would do differently looking back? Oh man, as far as marketing and sales go or anything? Anything. Anything? Ooh. I would, there's a couple of things. One, I would have gotten into more farmer's markets because I only did one. And I think that that slowed us down. Yeah. It was, uh, the fact that I was only in one farmer's market and I only got to a certain amount of people. So I probably would have joined another one at least, um, maybe two. Um, another thing that we did is that we tried to start off with the very highest end product um, so we, we were doing organic and soy free turkeys and chickens at the beginning. We did that for two years. And, uh, after doing all the math, we were losing money and we were still charging like exorbitant prices. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I almost think like five, six times what you would buy for in groceries. Yes. Kind of prices. Yep. Yeah. 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 Like, yeah. yeah. Like six X and so I would encourage young farmers that the people, your customers care mostly that the animals are raised outside and that they're raised well. Yep. Um, if you, you'll have a tiny percentage of your customers. Maybe 10%. Maybe. Maybe. 5%. Okay. That, like, that really want your chickens to your, be like your meat or chickens to be organic. Solely for your, yeah. Yeah. We did, we went through the same thing. It was like, I'd love to be organic. I believe in it. I want to support it. But yeah. there's no organic growers where I can get feed from near me. And the cost is just so exorbitant. Yeah. I'm already three, four times what they pay in the grocery store. I, I'd have to be seven or eight times. Yep. Just to satisfy that one customer. Yes. Let's satisfy the 90% or 95%. Yep. Yep. For okay with patched arrays outside, nutrient dense. Yes and knowing you as the, as the farmer. Yep. They, that's like pasture raised, regenerative, and knowing your farmer is like the most important things to your, to your customer base. Yep. Then feed is probably next or like- Flavor. Yeah, nutrient, flavor and texture. profile. Yep. Big. Yep. And then like you'll have a very fringe, small group of people that care about what, how the slaughterhouse is operated, what the feed is, yeah. and, and uh, 
what the packaging is like. You know, you have a very tiny group of people. But don't waste your time on this. No, it's not worth it. <laughs> don't let the 80, 20, don't let 20% yeah. of your customers yeah. take up 80% of your time. Yeah. Don't let it happen because it will happen naturally. If you let it, you'll, you'll try to cater to everyone and then you'll cater to no one. Mm -hmm. One thing we, we still do is that we found that people do want a really high end egg. So we, we started with a soy free organic egg, then we switched to a non GMO egg. And now we've actually bounced back to a corn free, soy free organic egg. And we found a lot of people really like that. But what we did is we started to partner with like other farms to sell a regular farm egg as well. So you have two options. So two options. Okay. I wouldn't do that with anything but eggs. Yeah. Because you start to kind of lose your mind and start losing track of who's who's and yeah, yeah. what's what. If you had two chickens in the freezer and one of them was organic and one of them wasn't, you know, it'd be really hard to track. Sure. all that um yeah. and, and makes sense and try to map that out as a farm business and your scheduling it would be a nightmare so we just have our flock that's organic corn free soy free and then we buy a regular farm pasture raised farm egg from another farm one of the main reasons we did that is there's not a ton of local farms here in charleston but the ones that we do have all raise the same egg mm -hmm. okay, it's a brown pasture raised egg and there's like six of them that do that um and we're all at the farmer's market trying to compete so that differentiates you yeah. so we did the rainbow eggs and we did the really fancy high-end egg if you're in an area where there's only like two or three other farmers i would say go with a regular egg don't kill yourself on feed raise them right let them eat bugs and grass get a get a conventional or a non-gmo feed and start there so that you don't find out in two years that you've been losing money on just because of the feed costs. Yeah. Because we're gonna see feed costs continue to go up and up, especially in, in us guys at the bottom, the smallest guys, we're gonna be the ones to pay for it first. Yeah. Plans for the future for the farm. Yeah. Um, we're gonna try to continue to grow the, the enterprises that we have. Um, we just moved to a 96 acre farm. And so we've got, uh, our grazing acreage is up to about 120 to 130 acres now, instead of um, it was just about 45 or 50 acres before. So that's exciting. We're gonna be able to probably double our cattle herd. Um, we're gonna continue to raise more broilers, more turkeys, um, more laying hens. And then something I really wanna get into in the future is uh, meat goats. I think that meat mm. goats are are gonna be, I might be a little bit ahead of my time, <laughs> but I think that meat goats are gonna be a huge part of the food, the future in the food system in America. Yeah. Everywhere you drive on the highway, there's goat food everywhere. There's, there's kudzu, there's oh, yeah, they, they eat brambles and bushes. Kind of brambles and yeah, yeah, I think bushes. they might be the most sustainable meat source. Especially in our area, we're so yes. overgrown and woody. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So uh, I'm not there yet. All we have are like some, a few like party goats that are yeah. just for show. Yeah. But I think that, that meat goats, they don't need a ton of space. They're tough and hardy. You can't, I mean, you can try to kill them, but they, they live for a long time. So w that's in our long-term goal is, is to try to get the meat goat thing going. Cool. I had goat for lunch yesterday at a Jamaican restaurant and yeah. it was freaking awesome. Nice. I mean, it wasn't weird. It didn't taste weird. Yeah. It, it, it was great. So I think, cool. I think goat is going to have a huge part to play in the, in the future of the food system in America. We'll get there eventually for now. We're probably just going to be doubling our numbers, continue to grow. We might even do some advertising. Like we haven't done any marketing really, we've tried to do like a couple Facebook ads and then we stopped them after a week. So we'll probably um, try to start working on that. If we're gonna double our products, we need to double our sales. Sure. So we might get into some online marketing stuff as well. So last two questions. Uh, first one, um, what's the biggest uh, lesson or word of advice that you've learned the hard way? 
to young farmers yeah. starting up, yeah. I would say try to keep your progress as organic as possible. Meaning don't try to shoot for the moon right away and bite off more than you can chew. Yeah. Um, you're gonna end up with meat in the freezer that's been there too long. You're gonna end up with products that aren't up to your standards. Mm -hmm. Because Try. when you're doing multiple enterprises, you're spreading time, you're yeah. spreading your finances, you're spreading your attention, your energy. Yes. All these different ways. Yep. You just focus maybe on one or two things max. Yes. Get that Start down. Start with in. one or two enterprises yep. and, and get really good at those. And if you wanna, topic. yeah, if you don't, <laughs> if you wanna sell beef, pork, chicken, and eggs, don't be afraid and don't be ashamed to sell someone else's for a little while. Like, it's okay if you just wanna raise hogs and layers and you have a really awesome farm two hours away from you that does broilers really well and another guy that does grass-fed beef really well. As long as it's legal in your area, don't be afraid or ashamed to sell someone else's. That's a great idea because there's a lot of synergy there. You're also, not only are you offering your customers other options and, and the full menu, so to speak, yeah. but you've got a lot of synergy. That farm's promoting you, you're promoting that farm. Yeah. So now you got double the marketing, exactly. double the number of customers, right? Yep, yep. And those are the three main, four main proteins that people eat. Yep. With fish and seafood in there as well. Beef, pork, chicken, and eggs. And if you can become kind of a one-stop shop for your customers, I would encourage a lot of people to do that. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and start slow. And, and don't sink all your whole life savings into something and, and go head first without knowing that you can do it, you can do it well, and that you're going to enjoy doing it. Because I've seen some people try to get into this and, they, and they'll buy 40 head of cattle and 40 hogs and start farrowing and, and get broilers going and it, it can all crash and crumble and they end up hating it and regretting it. Mm -hmm. So make sure that you that you can do it, that you can do it well and that you enjoy it. Because it, on paper, yeah. you'll read a Joel Salatin book and you'll be so inspired and you'll want to go farm and you'll, you'll want to like, quit your job, quit your town job, and go for it all in without having any experience. And that can go really, really bad. Yeah. I would I would discourage people from doing that and yeah. encourage them to start growing some chickens in their backyard, get a garden, maybe get two pigs. Make sure you like it first. So that was like five tips. Less yeah, that's sorry. Good. That's good. No, that's actually credit. That's credit. So you got like good five. Yeah. So that's awesome. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Bonus there. Um, and then last thing, um, when you're not farming, what's your favorite hobby? Where, where, where would you Oh, doing? I have two, well, I'd be remiss to say hanging out with my family uh, if I forgot to say that. Love my family and spending time with my Put that disclaimer little in there. kids. Yeah. Now, what's your favorite Put hobby? Put that one in. <laughs> <laughs> For my hobbies, uh, I'm a musician and an athlete as well. So, uh, not professional by any means, but I do like to uh, play drums and get out and, and play with other people and, and make sure I can have my creative expression somewhere else. And I join a men's basketball league and, and make sure I get my competitive thing out as well. Nice. And uh, it's good to have a break. That way I don't take it out on my wife and kids. And it's good to have a break <laughs> from the farm too, right? So yes. I find that to be very important to make sure that you get time off the farm. Yeah. You have a beer with your friend. You, you go and throw a frisbee with somebody, you, you talk and sit down and talk to people because you will get sucked into this. And, and it, it's, it's a vortex <laughs> yeah. that consume will consume every minute, you. Every second of your life. The project <laughs> list will grow faster than, yeah. than how fast you can knock stuff out off the list. So you gotta pace yourself and remember that you're still a human being with human needs. You need social interactions, you need to have some fun and you need to be able to get creative and express yourself on other other avenues yeah. as well. Yeah, well so, said. Yeah. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, brother. Great advice. Yeah. Appreciate it. Always great yeah. seeing you, talking to you. Yeah. So we appreciate it. Thanks for having me.